we are with Anjana Bagil that is going to speak us about the Python by code. So thanks to the, to the speaker. I feel like we need like, you know, stand up comics here to open up the crowd or something. Um, hi, I'm Anjana Bakil, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys are excited about bytecode, because I am. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So, uh, who am I? Well, my name is Anjana, and I'm a Pythonholic. Uh, I've been addicted to Python for probably about three years. <laughs> no, I am, um, right now I, I use Python as an outreachy intern at Mozilla to do some testing work for them. But what I want to talk to you about today is um, some explorations into the core of Python that I started doing while I was a participant at the Recurse Center, which is a really cool programming community in New York City where you're allowed to just follow whatever excites you about programming. So um, today I'd like to tell you a little bit about an adventure that I had that involved uh, getting started with Python bytecode. I'm by no means an expert in it, but I just wanted to bring you along on my first uh, encounters with it and show you why I think it's really cool. So while I was at the Recurse Center, um, I came across this puzzle. I think of it as a Python puzzle. It turns out that Python code runs uh, faster if you stick it inside of a function and then call that function. Maybe you guys are already familiar with this. I was not. But uh, for example, if we have a rather lengthy for loop that does nothing useful, it just, uh, just evaluates a variable i for each i in a rather long string of i's. Um, if we call that just in the global Python module, it takes quite a bit longer than if we stick it inside this run loop function and then call that function once. And to me, this was puzzling because uh, looking at this source code, I don't see any real meaningful difference. Um, in fact, all I see in the inside function version on the right is that, uh, if anything, Python should have more work to do because it's got to create a function and then call it. So I couldn't really understand from looking at the source code why this would be so much faster, the right-hand side. Turns out that uh, looking at the bytecode can give us a little bit more insight than looking at the source code for certain types of Python uh, puzzles, like this one. And um, that all has to do with what happens when we run Python code. So this was something I hadn't really ever thought too much about before. What happens when I actually execute a Python program? And today, um, I'm just talking about CPython. A lot of this is uh, implementational detail specific to the CPython interpreter, but hopefully that's what a lot of you guys are using. And uh, differences between CPython and other interpreters are also really fascinating, but not the topic today. So when we're using CPython to run some Python code, we start out with our beautiful, Pythonic, easy to read, uh, nicely indented source code that looks fantastic. And uh, that gets compiled by part of, the, uh, part of CPython that's called a compiler. It gets turned into a parse tree, an abstract syntax tree, a control flow graph. What those are doesn't really matter for our purposes right now. They're all just different abstractions of what we want our code to do. The important part is that ultimately gets compiled down to bytecode, which obviously we'll be talking a bit more about in a moment. Um, and that bytecode, whatever it is for now, gets passed to the interpreter and is what the interpreter actually runs. The interpreter being a virtual machine that is performing operations on a stack of objects. So the interpreter executes that bytecode and then you get out whatever awesome stuff your Python program is designed to do. Great. Okay, so this bytecode, what is it? Well, uh, as we saw, it goes kind of in between. It comes at an in-between place between your source code and the effects of your program. So in one sense, it's an intermediate representation of your program. Um, and in fact, it's the representation that the interpreter itself sees. The interpreter, unfortunately, doesn't get to look at your beautiful, readable, Pythonic source code. It only gets to see this bytecode. So, um, if we think about the interpreter as a virtual machine, we could think about the bytecode as the machine code for that virtual machine. So when we think of more uh, languages that are traditionally considered compiled, we think of taking source code and translating that into machine instructions for an actual physical machine. In this case, uh, it's pretty much the same idea, it's just that the machine is virtual and is the Python interpreter instead of uh, the, the actual uh, physical machine. And so, since the virtual machine, the Python interpreter that we're dealing with is, is basically a stack machine, it, the bytecode that we give it is a series of instructions for what to do. 
which objects to add on to that stack, how to, how to, um, which operations to perform on objects that are already on it, how to pop things off and return them back to us. So it's a series of instructions, the bytecode is. And another uh, interesting thing, if you've ever wondered about those .pyc files that pop up all over the place when you're importing uh, Python modules, these are actually caches of the bytecode. This is the bytecode that the compiler has already spit out. And the nice thing about this caching mechanism is that since we saw that from source code to execution, we have that, those two steps, the compilation and then the interpretation, if we haven't updated the source code since the last time we ran the program, we can skip the first part. We can reuse uh, the bytecode that we already compiled before. So that's what those PyC files are. And uh, if you've ever tried to read one of those, to open one of them, they're gobbledygook. Uh, they're not meant for us measly, measly humans to understand. So how can we, humans, read this bytecode that's intended to be read, read by Python? Well, there's a really handy module called DIS, which has a fun name. It stands for disassembly, so disassembling the bytecode. Um, the documentation is, is right up there, put the link in there. Um, and this allows us to analyze uh, certain types of Python objects to, f to read it's the, the, the bytecode for that object in a way that we humans can understand instead of looking at the bytes themselves, which isn't that helpful to us. Um, so for example, if I have a really simple function that says uh, that is called hello and returns, uh, can somebody help me pronounce with the, the Basque here? Kaicho, Kai, Kaicho, trying. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if we diss this function, hello, we get our first peek at disassembled bytecode. Cool, these two white lines at the bottom here are our really, really simple uh, bytecode. We just have two instructions here and without really knowing what all these numbers are, what the columns are, what we're looking at, we can already get a sense for what's happening. We're loading some kind of constant, a string, onto the stack and then we're returning it. Sweet. So uh, let's break it down. What exactly are we looking at here? What does it mean when we see the output of this? So we have a series of rows where each row in the output is an instruction to the interpreter. And on the left hand side, a lot of the time we'll see a line number. Two here is the line in our source code. So this is just for us to help us know what, how the source code lines up with the bytecode. Not every line in the instructions will have a line number. As you can see here, the return value line doesn't have one. That's because sometimes more than one instruction can fit on one source code line. So um, sometimes we, we, we only see the line number when it's the instruction that starts the line. And Next to that, we can see an offset in bytes uh, to how far into this, into this uh, string of bytes is this particular operation. That's not super interesting in my perspective for us humans. But what is interesting is the next thing, which is this string, load const. Load constant is what it stands for, and that's the name of the operation. And in a minute, we'll look at some more of those and see where we can find out about all the different possible operations you could encounter when you're reading this disassembled bytecode. Uh, if the operation in question takes arguments, which not all of them do, but if it does, then you'll see some information about the arguments on the right-hand side. So those last two columns on the right, um, we see the argument index, which interpreting that and what it exactly means, index in what object, that depends on the operation. There are a few different places that Python keeps track of the different values like constants or variable names that you would need to carry out a particular operation. And that's all uh, something you can look up in the documentation. But what's more interesting for our purposes now is the uh, value of that argument, which you can see to the right in parentheses. And this is Python kind of giving you silly human, a little hint about what it is that, that this uh, um, operation is operating on. So some operations, we've already seen uh, load constant, which takes an argument C and it pushes C onto the top of the stack, TOS. Um, then there are things like binary add, which takes whatever is already on the top of the stack, the top two items, adds them together and puts that result on the top of the stack. And then there's things like call function, which its argument is a bit strange. Its argument tells it how many positional or keyword arguments that function is expecting so that it knows how many objects to take off of the top of the stack and in which order uh, to pass to that function. So uh, there's a ton of these. I would not be able to cover them all, even if I had an hour or more, whole day. Uh, but they're all conveniently documented in the documentation for the dis library, uh, the dis module. So that's 
uh, linked at the top of the page here. And um, for each of these operations, the names that we see, these operation names are just for us humans. Python doesn't care. It has a number for each of them, of course. That's called the op code or the operation code. And if you're curious about what the correspondence between a name and a code is for a given operation, you can use um, these attributes disopmap and disopname. Opmap is a dictionary where you can just look up a particular uh, operation name and find out its code. And if you happen to already know the code, you can uh, pass it to opname, and it is an indexed list of all the the uh, sequence of all the operations, so you can find out which code corresponds to which name. Just some convenience there. And uh, so now we have a basic idea of how the dis function works, how we can disassemble some bytecode. What can we use it on? Let's try to dis some things. Let's find out what we can dis. I love this name. OK, <laughs> so we already saw we can dis a function. Here's a nice little Pythonic example one. We're adding spam and eggs. And if we dis add, we see we have a slightly, ever so slightly more complex uh, uh, thing to do here, which is we're loading two things on spam and eggs, and then we're doing a binary add on that. Cool starting to get comfortable with this. What else can we dis? How about a class? For a really simple class here, it's a parrot. It's got a, one attribute called kind. It's a Norwegian blue. This is Monty Python humor for anyone that's not familiar. Um, and it has a method, is dead, which always returns true. <laughs> and when we pass that parrot class to dis, we see that it disassembles each of the methods on that class, so including the, the constructor method. And so here we've got, uh, let's see, um, ah, a, new, a new operation name here in the disassembly of uh, Dunder init. Here we have store attribute. Cool. So we're starting to get familiar with some of these new uh, operation names. In my experience, a lot of the times they're self-explanatory. But if you're ever curious, OK, I don't know what that code, what that operation name does, just go to the disk documentation. It's all laid out. Um, Another thing we can disassemble if we're using Python 3.2 or newer is a string uh, that contains valid Python code. So we don't have to actually uh, put that code in a module. We can just use it, uh, disassemble the string directly. It gets compiled to a code object, and then that code object gets disassembled. So uh, here we are just assigning spam and eggs on one line, which is a cool thing Python lets us do. And we see a new thing, like unpack sequence, also a pretty self-explanatory operation name. OK, we, what about an entire module? Let's say I have a really simple module called knights.py. It has one line. It says print the string ni. Um, I can actually disassemble that straight from the command line by passing uh, the m flag and the dis module, uh, and then dis the entire contents of that knights.py. Cool, so now we see, aha, we're calling this function print, and we see the argument to call function is like some number of positional and keyword arguments. That's what I was talking about before. Uh, but what we, can, what we can gather from this is that we're loading on this constant, and then we're calling the function print on it. Cool. I think it's cool, anyway. <laughs> All right, what about uh, another way to dis a module? Well, as we saw, we can use code strings. We can, we can dis code strings. So what if we read in the module using the open.read? Uh, function. So now we have the whole contents of the module as a string, and we can dis that. Cool. It's basically the same thing as last time. Uh, there's a little, one less kind of return there, but essentially we're getting the same functionality. Good to know. And uh, the another way we can we can dis a module is by importing it and then dissing the imported uh, object. In this case, knights.py got a little more complicated. We added this uh, method. Uh, is flesh wound, or a function is flesh wound, which always returns true. And as you'll notice, when I import knights, the whole module is getting executed. It prints neat. But um, in, the, in the disassembled bytecode, we don't see any mention of the printing part. All we see is, is flesh wound. So when you do it this way, when you try to dis a module this way by importing it, um, it's only going to disassemble the functions in that module. Anything else that's there just kind of as a script is going to get. Uh, is not going to get put in the output of dis. So that's just something to know about the different ways of using dis. OK, uh, is there anything else we can dis? How about nothing? What if we pass no arguments to it? In this case, we're not dissing nothing. We're dissing the last traceback, the last error, um, which is a cool thing. Because let's say I tried to print this variable spam, which I had forgotten to assign. Uh, so I get this name error, of course. Um, if I do dis.dis .dis with no arguments, I can see the bytecode that tells me exactly where uh, that error came from. So you see the arrow 
um, to the left of the operation names there, that indicates that, okay, when I loaded print, that was fine, I found print, okay, but when I loaded spam, um, I had a problem. So, these are some different things that we can diss, which if you're like me, is just fun to just spend lots of time just dissing everything you can get your hands on just to see what they do. Um, and apparently can also help you in solving some puzzle challenges that one of the sponsors has out there. Uh, but other than that, why do we care about doing this? Why do we want to do this if we're not at a conference where we get free USB power packs if we solve puzzles? Well, as we saw, when we use um, the dist.dist with no arguments, uh, that's a really useful debugging tool because sometimes the error messages that we get from Python, although they're usually wonderful, sometimes they don't tell us everything we need to know. So for example, let's say, let's say I had a line in a really complicated mathematical uh, uh, code there that, that is dividing two, has two division operations on the same line. So ham divided by x plus ham divided by spam. That gives me a zero division error, and it tells me what line in my code the zero division error came from, but it doesn't tell me whether it was eggs or it was spam that gave me the error. If I diss the traceback, I can actually see that, okay, we were going through, we loaded ham, we loaded eggs, we did a true divide, and there was no problem. Ah, okay, so eggs was fine, then we loaded ham again, and we loaded spam, and then when we did that divide, that's, that little arrow says that's where the problem was. So I know that uh, the problem in my complex mathematical computations is spam, and that's what I have to go back and fix. So this can be a really cool debugging tool for certain situations, and uh, it can also be a helpful tool to solve puzzles, not just the kind that the sponsor has, but also the kind that I mentioned at the beginning, where we have um, this for loop which takes a lot longer outside of a function than in, and yet in the source code it looks pretty much identical. So um, let's try and get a little bit more insight here by dissing this outside function module and um, the run loop function from the inside function module and see how they compare. Okay, so we have outside function.py. Now we know a few different ways of, of dissing a module. I'm gonna choose the, the reading, the open.read method and get a string called outside and then um, diss that. So this is now what Python sees when we run that outside function.py. Okay, I don't understand all of this. I don't necessarily need to. I can get a general sense of what's going on. We're loading this range function. We've got a really well, somewhat big number that we're loading in. Then um, we have, ah, this new thing, get iter and for iter. For iter, that's our, that's our for loop there. So that's what that looks like to Python, cool. And then inside of that, we're, we're storing i, uh, I guess for each time we go through the for loop, and then we're loading i because we had a really, really useful for loop in that code that we just saw. Um, and okay, all right, seems to make somewhat sense. Let's see how it compares with inside. So uh, from, uh, from the inside function.py file, what we care about is this run loop function. So I'm gonna import that in, I'm gonna call it inside, just for convenience and symmetry, and then I'm gonna diss inside. Uh, at first glance, this looks pretty much the same as what we just saw. So let's see if switching back and forth really fast will tell us anything. Outside, inside, outside, inside, okay. Okay, so what do we notice? Differences. Well, first of all, on the left-hand side, we notice that some of the line numbers are different. That's because we had one extra line in the, uh, in the inside function. We had that function definition. That's probably not important. What else we got? Aha, with the range function, in one case it's, load, oops, it's loading as a name, in one case it's loading as a global. All right, maybe there's some difference there, but we're only doing that once, so oops, that's probably not that big of a deal. What we probably care more about is what happens inside the iteration, so after that for iter. And here we see, okay, when we're doing inside, we're using something called store fast and load fast, and when we're doing outside, it's store name and load name. See 16 and 19 there? So I don't know what those mean. Store fast sounds like it would be faster, and load fast sounds like it would be faster, but uh, I don't know why or, or what these do, so how can I find out? Well. It can investigate by going into the dis uh, documentation where it has a list of all of the different operation codes and tells you what they do. I've just copied those over here. Okay, store name, let's see, name, name, I, index, okay, code names, I don't know what that is. All right, load name, it's using code names again. Okay, 
Uh, so it looks like store name has something to do, it has to look up something with an index, and then it goes, finds the attribute. And so maybe that's something that could be possibly slowing us down, whereas store fast and load fast, they're using something else called co -var names, and we don't see anything about looking up indices and whatever, so that might have something to do with it. This is starting to get me on the right path. And uh, if you're really interested in digging in, if, uh, if the disk documentation hasn't answered all of your questions, you can go right to the beating heart of Python and dig deeper into cval.c, which uh, is where the Python interpreter uh, processes all of these different codes. And um, there's a really cool talk by Allison Kaptur called a 1500 line switch statement powers your Python. This is true. There is a huge switch statement where it's, it's telling CPython what to do with all the different operation uh, codes that you might encounter. And so um, if we look at the, the actual code for those operations, load fast and load name, we see that load fast is like a little bitty thing. It's like 10 lines. And it involves a lookup into an array called fast locals, which sounds fast because it is fast. Um, load name, on the other hand, first of all, it's more code, it's longer, it's more complicated, it's about 50 lines, and it involves a dictionary lookup, which is quite a bit slower. Um, so it turns out that one of the main speed differences here, which is a little bit tangential to the bytecode discussion, is that when you have a code inside of a function, because when you define the function, you know how many um, variables you need in that function, Python can just assign a fixed length array um, so when it needs to look up something in that function, it can just index into that array and pull it out really quickly. Whereas when you have it in the global scope, it doesn't know. You might, you might assign new variables all the time, so it keeps things in a dictionary, and so looking up from that dictionary is a bit slower. Anyway, then there's another thing called uh, opcode prediction, which makes it uh, even faster if you combine certain operations together, because CPython can predict what's coming next, and uh, it has an idea, um, it can save some, some ticks by, by uh, doing common operations that always go together. Uh, by predicting it in advance. And so the combination for iter and store fast happens to be one of these predicted combinations. It moves a lot faster than combining for iter and store name. So uh, if you're curious, I saw so strongly suggest you check out this really cool Stack Overflow conversation, Why Does Python Code Run Faster in a Function, and Alice and Captor's talks, which talk a bit more about how we can start exploring um, this giant switch statement that tells Python how to interpret all of these different operation codes.